assumption of sphericity, which is almost inexplicable in terms of just looking at the word. But if you say something like homogeneity of sum of variances minus covariance, I think that makes sense. And that's actually what has to be equal for sphericity to be satisfied. So let's look at an example. If I collected data from 25 depressed patient, patients who underwent a treatment, and depression data were collected on three occasions, pre-treatment, post-treatment, and follow-up, you might get data like this. And in fact, I've simulated the data to be quite similar to what you get in practice. And this explains why the assumption of sphericity is almost always violated in practice. And what happens is the variances from pretreatment to post-treatment to follow-up almost invariably increase because people respond to the treatment differentially. Some people respond really well, and some people don't respond well at all. And that causes variability in depression scores. Whereas at pretreatment, pretty much everyone is depressed roughly to the same degree. They're all clinically depressed. They get the treatment, time elapses, and they, they respond differentially. So that causes variances alone to be different from pretreatment, post-treatment to follow up. And then if you look at the covariances between treatments, so from pretreatment to post-treatment and pretreatment to follow up and post-treatment to follow up, those are almost invariably different in practice as well. Now the assumption of sphericity is based on covariances, but intuitively it's probably better to think about correlations in this context. And what you see in practice is that the levels that are closer together tend to high, have a higher correlation with each other and a higher covariance. So what you see is pretreatment to post-treatment, the correlation is 0.72, and then pretreatment to follow-up, you get a correlation of 0.58. So it's reduced in magnitude. So you not only get differences in variances across time, you get differences in the strength of the association between scores from one level to the next. And uh, post-treatment and follow-up here is a correlation of 0.39. So you get variabilities in the covariances slash correlations, and you get variabilities in the variances. And this is how you could calculate those terms uh, for each of the comparisons. Now, again, you wouldn't do separate dependent sample t-tests, typically, but you would, in the repeated measures ANOVA, you're pooling something. You're pooling an error term to estimate a standard error, the difference between means, if you will. And in this case here, the uh, difference, the sum of the variance minus the two times the covariance for pretreatment and post-treatment is 19.82. And then when you look at pretreatment and follow-up, it works out to be 45.18. And then for post-treatment and follow-up, you get 55.56. And sphericity is assuming that these values, 19.82, 45.18, and 55.56, are equal to each other within sampling fluctuations. And we can see just gut feel numerically, they look very different to each other. And we use something called Mochley's test of sphericity to test the hypothesis that the sum of the variances minus two times the covariance is equal across all possible comparisons. And in this case here, testing it through SPSS, I can see that Mochley's W is 0 0.506, approximate chi-square 15.682, and it's statistically significant. It's less than 0 0.05. And I don't want that typically uh, because I want sphericity to be uh, satisfied. But in this case here, because p less than 0 0.05, the assumption of sphericity has not been met. So I must make an adjustment in order to interpret the ANOVA F test. And one of those adjustments is greenhouse geyser. That's probably the most popular one. When you only have two levels, I get this question often, or people get com uh, perplexed. When you only have two levels, like a true dependent sample t-test, and there are only two levels, uh, there's no possibility of violating sphericity. Uh, and that's because there are only two variances and one covariance. There's only one sum of the variances minus two times covariance that you can calculate. You can't compare it against any other uh, comparison. There's only one comparison. There's only one sum of the variance minus covariance. Now, I mentioned already, very often the assumption of sphericity is violated. And that's just the nature of reality. 
uh, and I, my, my hunch is, if I had to throw out a number, 80% of the time, sphericity is, is violated. But fortunately, there are some attractive adjustments that can be made, like greenhouse geyser. And uh, people do use that, and uh, there are differences across the adjustments that you make, and I'll probably make a separate video talking about which ones are more attractive under what circumstance. So that's the end of uh, this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I know myself, I struggled trying to understand what sphericity truly was, even though I knew what it was. I didn't understand its gut feel implication for the analysis, but I think if you think of it in terms of some of the variances, minus two times covariance, it makes a lot of sense. So I hope you enjoyed this video, and I'll catch you next